So this morning we are continuing our study, the book of Romans. We have made our way to chapter 3, and today we're going to uh, learn on chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. So if you are able to stand for the reading of God's word, let's please do so now. As we go to Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 5. And the infallible word of God reads as follows. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then, how could God judge the world? But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory. Why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, for instructing us by your scriptures. We pray that as we learn today that we would humble our thoughts that may be in error about you, that your Holy Spirit may give us understanding. We ask that you would give us a sound mind to think and to apply what we learn today. Help us, Lord, to trust only in the work of Christ for our salvation. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So I've titled the sermon for today, basically a, a short snippet from verse 8 that we just read, which is, should we do evil that good may come? The Apostle Paul touches more than once on that particular theme. Should we do evil so that good or so that grace would abound? Now, quick recap. Every time I'm up here preaching, I like to do just a quick snapshot of where we at. That way, if someone were to be here for the first time, or someone listens to this, they would be able to, as a standalone, listen to one sermon and be able to get the context of what we're talking about. So the letter to the Romans, Paul has been making the case so far that God is impartial in his judgment, both to the Greco-Romans, to the Gentiles, as well as to the Jewish people. God is impartial. And Paul has been driving this point home that both the Gentile and the Jew are both lost if they trust in their own doings, in their own benefits, or lack thereof. Both of them need the gospel, which Paul declared sort of up front in verse 16 of chapter 1 when he said that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. For who? For those who believe. Both to the Jew and to the Gentile. Right? And before Paul goes back to expound on the need and the application of the gospel, first, Paul is stripping away all the defense mechanisms, so to speak, that either the Jew or the Gentile would have to say, eh, I'm actually okay, or that doesn't apply to me, or that applies to something else. No, Paul is ripping away all those arguments so that they understand the bad news before they truly understand the good news and can embrace the good news of the gospel. More on that a bit later. So what is Paul's in, intent here in this portion that we just read? Now many times, especially if we are relatively new to, to reading the Bible, we could say, ah, that kind of doesn't make sense. I don't know. I don't get it. My friends, this is a time for us to think and for us to apply what we're reading. And my attempt is to break down what the intent of Paul is in each section of the book of Romans. In this portion we just read, Paul is dealing with potential objections from his audience. To the Jewish listeners, they would quickly agree that God is judge, 
and that God will judge people. But in the Jewish mind, they think we are part of God's chosen people. We are the, the people of God. We are the Jewish nation. So God will judge, and he's going to judge all those dirty Gentiles out there. We're good. And what Paul is doing, he says, hold on a minute, not so fast. My Jewish brethren, right? Because Paul was a Jew. Paul is going out of his way to make sure that his Jewish brethren understand that they are under false pretense if they think that based on the fact that they are Jewish, that they are right before God just because they are Jewish. And to this, we come to our first application. Wouldn't there be a similarity as we meet here on Sunday, as we watch a sermon on the net, or as we listen to a podcast that talks about God, or, or whether it's a, a sermon podcast, we would perhaps be quick to say, well, you know, I congregate, I listen to Christian radio, to Christian music, so I'm okay. Those people that have no interest to congregate, those people that have no interest in the words of, of God, in the things of God, plainly speaking, those people, those people are lost and they're in danger of judgment. Drawing the parallel from the section of scripture we're talking about today, Paul is in effect telling us, hey, churchgoers, hey, Christian podcast listeners, hey, children who grew up in Christian homes, not so fast. And that's because we can easily think that because we are engaging in a certain Christian activity or Christian practice, that all of a sudden we're okay. Well, no, I attend the church. Maybe my parents prayed for me or my grandparents prayed for me, so I should be okay. My dear listener today, no, Paul is telling you, be careful. We cannot rest on anything we do because just like the Jewish listeners that were objecting to Paul, we too need a savior, just like the people out there in the world need a savior. And the fruit of knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior will manifest in our obedience, in our daily living. So let's get to Paul's point then. In the style that he's writing, remember it's a diatribe, Paul is teaching, he is answering objections that he knows are coming. And those objections in this particular section began when we heard our deacon James preach last week. In which the objection was, okay, Paul, you're telling us that the Jew needs to be circumcised in the heart. And that if we have all these rituals and all these traditions, that they're no good. So the objection goes like this, then what good is it being a Jew? Is there any benefit? Is there any advantage to being a Jew? To having the Old Testament? To be in covenant with God through Abraham? Is that of value or is that all worthless? Does our unfaithfulness as Jews, they would say, does that make God unfaithful? The answer was, no, God will be faithful. And the Jewish people did have an advantage. Let us think of a way which we can illustrate whether someone, when it comes to the things of God, has an advantage or not. Let's picture for a while a scenario that would be pretty um, common in our culture today. Let's say that we have two homes. In one, a child is being raised within a Christian home in a Christian context. On the other hand, we have a, another household that is not Christian. And there's, although the Christian homes are not perfect, they're far from perfect, but nevertheless, they are engaging in the activities that a Christian family would. Church going, praying, praying for the kids specifically. The other home, not so much. No acknowledgement of God, or maybe a little bit. No church going, at least not regularly. Broken home, rough upbringing of that child. Now let me ask something. Does the child being raised in the Christian home have any advantage? The obvious is yes, right? However, 
let us think about this. As much as the child being raised in a Christian home has the advantage, the child being raised in a rough upbringing, perhaps even suffering in their upbringing, both of those children need the gospel. And unless both of them repent and come to the Lord Jesus in repentance and faith, both of them will perish regardless of who of the two had the advantage. So my dear children here present today, my dear young people here today, do not think that because you were raised in an environment in which you were exposed to the gospel, that that alone makes you right with God. No, as a matter of fact, you become more guilty because you know more than the child that doesn't know. Bear that in mind. Now, the types of objections that Paul is having are not purely imaginary. Paul didn't make up these rhetorical questions that he's answering. Rather, Paul was a scholar of scholars. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew the mind of his Jewish brethren. He was a Jew. In fact, some commentators argue that this rhetorical questions that Paul is answering in a sort of mono debate could be thought of as the Jewish Paul prior to conversion arguing and debating with the Christian Paul post conversion. So he understands the Jewish mind. Not only did he understand their context, but he had a normal practice of reasoning with, of debating with, of rebuttals against his Jewish ancestors. Let us get some insight of this from the book of Acts, in which is described much of this apologetic ministry that Paul engaged in. Acts 17, 17 reads as follows. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So we see here two things. Paul reasons in the synagogue, right? He goes to the synagogues and engages with them and talks to them about Jesus. How does he do that specifically? He's trying to show them that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. He engaged both in the synagogue and then secondly, in the marketplace. As Christians, we should not only engage and witness for and talk about Jesus in the church context. We do it in the church and we do it in the marketplace of ideas. There is no such thing as keeping your faith private. That is baloney. You can't do that. Right? Those that are making our laws, those that are ruling us, they have a worldview. And by and large, it is a secular, diabolical worldview. And if we don't stand up, if we don't have Christians infiltrate the institutions of our community, of our state, of our country, we are headed for destruction faster and faster. So anyways, he, Paul, knew his brethren. Acts 18.28 For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, Showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Again, an example of Paul engaging with his Jewish brethren. And it says, powerfully refuting them. My friends, if we want to be witnesses for Jesus, we need prayer, we need boldness, and we need preparation. Paul powerfully refuted them. From the scriptures that they knew. Right? But that they had twisted. Lastly, Acts 26 verses 2 and 3. This is Paul going before King Agrippa. And he says, I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa. I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusation of the Jews. Especially because you are familiar with all the customs and the controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So here we see that Paul knows 
and he's assuming that King Agrippa knows the controversies, the accusations against him. So these rhetorical questions that Paul is answering in the book of Romans are a sample of, a summary of, the arguments that his Jewish brethren would have against his preaching of the gospel. And he's addressing these in that context. So Paul reasoned, debated, refuted the religious Jewish folks who opposed his Christian message. He was familiar with the opposition to the Lordship of Christ, and he took them to task. So now we get an insight of the type of debates of how Paul refuted those arguments. And his response to those Jewish objections are in our text this very day before us. They are structured as follows. Let us take a look into three sections. First, the argument of does God depend on sinners to show his glory and his righteousness? Does God depend on sinners? To show his goodness. Secondly, if that is the case, if that first premise is the case, then is God right to judge evil? If God right, if God benefits from sinners, is he then right to judge evil? And thirdly, should we do evil so that good may come? Which is the title of our sermon. That's the answer we're looking for towards the end of the sermon. Should we do evil so that good may come? All right, so let us look at the first argument. Does God depend on sinners to show his, glorious, his glory and his righteousness? Let us take a look at Romans 3, the first part of verse 5. It reads, But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, we'll stop right there. Because that is the premise in which this objection is going to be formatted. In which the objection is going to be built upon. That is the premise. If our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God. The objection being built then. Paul will show is based on a false premise. Let us take a quick look at why. This would be equivalent to saying. As a child that is beginning to understand. That the child will say something like this. Hey, everybody, check it out. You want to see how good my dad is to me? Let me show you. I'm going to disrespect him. I'm going to disobey him. I'm going to basically spit on his face. And you'll see that he'll forgive me. Watch this. Would a loving, repentant child do that? No. No. Let me further illustrate this with a personal example. When my family and I moved to the US, we lived with very limited resources, struggling to get by. Lived in a small apartment, two cars, one of which was always breaking down. Specifically, when my sister and I went through college, my parents worked a tremendous amount to make it through each month. And even as a non-Christian family back then, we were not Christians. God's common grace sustained us. Now within that, there was a lot of sin. Not only for my family, but specifically for me. With that as a little bit of a background, there finally came a time when I got my first car. It was a 1998 Jetta Trek. Beautiful car. That myself and my parents sacrificed a lot for me to get. My parents had put some rules for me to use that car. Let me ask you this. Do you think I obeyed those rules? Nope. Long story short, I ended up crashing the car, totaling the car. I could have easily died in that accident. Easily. People who saw the pictures afterwards couldn't believe that I made it out alive. And I was not able to get another car. If that weren't enough, a short time later after that, as a result of my stubborn disobedience, once again, I also crashed my dad's car. Both times, 
despite my disobedience, who was there to pick me up? Who was there for me? My mom, my dad. And my sister too, but she was more like, ah, I told you so, right? <laughs> now, sometime after this incident, I became greatly grieved by the hurt I had caused my parents. Now, I grant you, that was worldly sorrow, but even then, God's common grace caused something within me to realize that I was wrong. I wasn't a Christian. But because I had reverence specifically for my father, I knew that I had grieved him greatly. And I realized that I had parents who loved me. And I vowed to myself, even in a worldly way, I cannot keep disobeying my dad. I'm dishonoring him. And he has showed me that he cares for me, that he loves me. So in my disobedience, this is the key now, the love and patience of my parents was shown. And it would be unloving for me to keep disobeying them, to keep dishonoring them, and causing them suffering and hardship, just to show you that my dad's going to be cool with me. You see that? So there is a parallel between that story and the text this morning. The Jewish folks that Paul is dealing with here have an objection that goes something like this. Paul, this is them speaking, you're telling us that if we disobey God, we are actually doing him a favor. Because through our disobedience and our sin, God will have a chance to show his forgiveness to all of us. It's a win-win. We are complacent and happy in our disobedience. And God gets to show how marvelous and gracious he is. You see, the absurdity of that premise, right? So does God need sinners in order to show his glory and righteousness? The answer is no. God does not need sinners or sinners to be disobedient in order to show his character. Let us show a few scriptures. Isaiah 6, verse 3, in describing the vision of God by the seraphim, it says, And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This attestation of the holiness of God, not dependent on human sinners. God alone is holy and righteous. Revelation 4, verse 8. Again, angelic creatures here. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Again, this attestation of the righteousness, of the holiness of God, not dependent on sinners, but declared by angelic beings. One last one. John 17, verse 11. This is Jesus talking. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. This attestation of God the Father being holy, not dependent on sinners, Jesus, the perfect one, God in the flesh, proclaiming that God is holy and righteous. So God does not depend on sinners to show his glory. Hence, the argument that sinners help God out by disobeying him so that God can show his goodness is flawed thinking. And Paul has a very strong warning here. How can we apply this to today? Again, another application for us. We can understand that God does not benefit from our disobedience or our rebellion against him. When he shows us his love, his mercy, his grace. It is for our benefit that he does it, not for his. He doesn't need us. 
Now, that's the good news, that God does show his goodness. He does show his grace. He does show his forgiveness over and over and over. And if you are here today, it's a marvelous sign of God's mercy that you are not far from his reach in getting his forgiveness. Now, please understand this. The good news of the gospel, that he does forgive us, that he does love us, cannot come and will not come to strike us and to change us unless we understand the bad news first. And this is what Paul has been doing here over and over and over with his listeners. So the application for us, let's get it clearly here again. All of us, churchgoers, non-churchgoers, professing Christians, all the children, the youth, and adult, old folks, hear me. God is not your friend just because you thought of a conception in your mind of who God is. No. There is nothing that you have done, that you have experienced, that you have learned, whether it's a church activity or otherwise, that will make you right with God. No. Unless you have been born again, unless you have thrown yourself on the mercy of Christ, you are an enemy of God. Let us please understand that. Do not depend on anything you have done or known or been raised with. I plead with you today. Depend only in Christ and show it by submitting to his lordship. So, does God need sinners to manifest his glory? No. Rather, we as sinners are in desperate need to know of and to experience the glory of God so that we may turn to God in repentance, acknowledging Jesus as our only Lord and Savior. God doesn't need sinners to show us that he's righteous. Secondly, is God right to judge evil? Romans 3, 5. Now let's look at the whole verse. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, Paul already, right? We've already seen that that's a false a false um, premise on which the argument is built. What shall we say then? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. Now, this is a very interesting text. Let me focus on that last part. When Paul says, I speak in a human way. I have heard an argument before of someone saying, Paul is actually not inspired and he admits it. This is one of the texts that some folks would point to. See, he says he's speaking in a human way. He's not inspired. Now, if we read this in context, the truth is that this is a figure of speech that Paul is using. And Paul is putting this as a disclaimer to the things that he is arguing against. There's, therefore, there's some sayings that would be normal to a Jewish listener that to us would make sense if transliterated exactly like they were written. Another translation reads as, quote, I am speaking according to men, unquote. And that means that Paul is speaking in a human way, from a human standpoint. Or as Walter Brower, a Greek-English lexicon scholar says, Quote, this emphasizes the inferiority of men in comparison with God. Unquote. Further, the late Leon Morris, in his commentary of this verse, he notes as follows. I think I have this quote there. He says, that God might be unrighteous is so wide of anything that is possible that Paul asks pardon for even mentioning it. So this is a disclaimer that Paul is putting in this section of the text. For one, God's righteousness is not dependent on sinners. And secondly, Paul, Paul here is expressing that this line of faulty thinking is a twisted way of interpreting how the glory of God is shown. So therefore, it's important to note that, yes, we can see the glory of God in his mercy towards sinners. We absolutely see that. 
However, we do not help God to show that righteousness by sinning against him. Think of the example of the child that is ungrateful to his loving dad, to his loving parents. So, is God unrighteous to inflict wrath on sinners? Verse 6 gives the answer. Romans 3, 6. By no means, for then how could God judge the world? If God is righteous, and he is, if God is holy, and he is holy, God must deal with sin. Sinners do not give God an opportunity by their sin to manifest God's glory. That is faulty thinking. God cannot and will not give anyone a pass for their sin. Young, old, middle-aged, nobody. And the Jewish folks knew this. Let's take a quick look at Genesis 18, 24, the end of that verse. It says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? The Jewish people understand that God is a righteous judge. But they understand that only in theory. When the Jewish mind reads of God being a judge, they think, yeah, those Gentiles, they were good. And the warning for us is, not just because we are in church, to say, yeah, God will judge those out there. No. What about us? That's an application we could really think about. While it may be true that God will judge those that are on the outside, let us not look at them first, but let us look at ourselves. As 1 Peter 4.17 says, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who, are not, who do not obey the gospel of God? So see, Peter reminds us, when we think of those inside the church and those outside the church, we are not to think of the judgment of God on those that are outside first. No, he says, first look at in the house of God and then worry about those that are outside. So God judges righteously and he judges sinners who have not repented, whether churchgoers or not. Aside from establishing that point throughout chapter 2, we also see that God is righteous and is impartial in his judgment. Peter also reminds us that in the same book, 1 Peter 1, verse 17, it says, And if you call to him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. So here Peter is warning those Christians that we are pilgrims. We are in exile. And we are headed for the eternal resting place with Christ. So then, the key here, do not think that we will win God's favor by trying to be good, by coming to church, by going to study, by ensuring that we pray. No, those things are good to do, but let's not think that because of that, we are going to be good enough to please God. The good fruit in our character and the constant maturing of our spiritual health should reflect in our conduct. And that will be a proof, not the reason of our salvation. So then, is God right to judge evil? Yes, God is absolutely right to judge evil. God would not be righteous if he didn't judge evil. Would a righteous judge here on earth be a good judge if he lets criminals go? Or if he's bribed into giving a wrong verdict. Now granted, this may happen and is happening, right? The court system many times get corrupted, but not so with the King of Kings and with the Lord of Lords. He cannot err. He will and must always deal with sin. The wrath of God will crush sinners in eternal condemnation. That is, all those who do not know Christ as Savior. And God will be vindicated in his judgment when he does so. All right, thirdly, 
Should we then do evil so that good may come? Remember the false premise? Our bad deeds show the glory of God. So therefore, God shouldn't judge us for doing sinful things, for living a sinful lifestyle. Rather, we should be rewarded. So let us do more evil so that God could show his goodness. Now we see the argumentation that Paul is doing, right? Take a look at Romans 3, 7 and 8. But if through my light God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? See, there it is. And why not do evil that good may come, as some slanderous, slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. Now, a quick side note. I have heard an objection two times, maybe more, but for sure two times that I remember, regarding whether Paul is a legitimate New Testament author or not. And therefore, whether the New Testament is of any value, since Paul wrote many of the letters in the New Testament. The claim goes something like this. Paul admits that he is a liar. So we shouldn't believe him. He openly admits to lying. He says, through my lie, God's truth abounds in glory. Now, if someone is crafty with that argument, it may sound a little confusing and even like, man, there might be some truth to that. My friends, I guarantee you that is an absurd objection. Here, Paul is following a line of thought, namely, that is absurd to hold a position that by sinning more, God's truth and glory will abound more. And that therefore, the sinner should not be condemned. So in the proper context, this, this particular passage here would be reasoned by someone who began with a false premise in verse 5. We sin, God gives us an opportunity to show his goodness. And this line here where Paul talks about that his lie will show God's truth, it would go something like this. If I were to lie, God's goodness and glory would be shown. Therefore, I, as a rebellious sinner, instead of being condemned, I should be rewarded for my sin. You see the absurdity of that? Paul is giving the example of how that would look. That is not only absurd, but it's blasphemous. Which is why Paul has put this disclaimer of this twisting of scripture. That he's saying he's speaking in flawed human terms, in flawed thinking. Paul discusses this further in chapter 5 and 6, which we'll deal with it when we get there. But let's take a quick peek. Romans 5.20 through 6.2. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So in the last portion of verse 8, of the previous text, the main text. Paul says that this charge has been made to his proclamation of the gospel of grace. He says that some have slandered, defamed the message of the gospel by charging him with saying, let us do evil that good may come. Now there's nothing new under the sun. Did you know that this is a common objection to reformed theology? No, oh, once saved, I was saved, then you're good. you have a license to sin. And this is why I say that the terminology is confusing and should not be used. Once saved, I was saved is not biblical. Hear me. What is biblical is, him who endures to the end will be saved. If you are wallowing in your sin, you probably are not saved. Newsflash. And if you went out into the world... And don't repent. You were never a Christian. It was just phoniness the whole time. So here lies the answer to our main question for today. Which is the sermon's title. Should we then do evil that good may come? May it never be. May it never be. 
If we are dead to sin, we better be under the lordship of Christ in obedience of faith. The last illustration for today. In the context of should we sin more that grace may abound or that the goodness of God will be shown, his glory. Have you ever thought, man, you know, I wish that I had a really dramatic conversion experience. Or I wish that I had like this crazy backsliding so that God could bring me back. And so that I could give testimony. Now granted, God has saved some people like that. God has shown his power in the truth that no one is out of the reach of the saving power of God. That is absolutely true. But my friends, if our thought has ever crossed our mind, man, you know, I wish that I was like a super wreck, wrecked sinner so that God would then save me from that. And I would have a more interesting testimony. My friends, let us be warned. That is actually not seeking glory for God. That is seeking glory for yourself. So that someone could say, wow, brother, sister, man, yeah, great job. Pat you in the back, right? Great testimony. No, let us not think this. As doing so is twisting God's word. We honor God not by doing evil, but by obeying Psalm 1 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. You see, we honor God by not going in the way of sinners. So then, God demands obedience and holiness from us. He commands us not to sin so that we can show his goodness to us. So what does Paul conclude this passage with? He says that those that have this type of thinking, right, in, in our contemporary theological terms that we can understand, it could be understood as cheap grace. Let me go and live whatever lifestyles, uh, lifestyle I want in sin so that God can forgive me. My friends, if someone is in that constant circle, vicious circle of sinning so that God will forgive you, Paul says, your condemnation is sure. You are not a Christian. And unless you repent, you will not know the true glory of God manifested in your life. So now let us close with a couple of reflections for us to apply today. First, to the skeptic, to the non-Christian, and maybe to those who at one point have professed to be Christians. But the lifestyle of that profession, the priorities of that lifestyle show otherwise. Let us consider this. We've seen the objections that the Jewish folks have for Paul. What are your objections? What are your objections when someone tries to talk to you about the gospel? Oh, no, that's maybe for you young folks. Oh, that's for older people. You know, that's, that's really not for me. Or maybe some objections of, hey, what about those that have not heard the gospel that you're trying to tell me right now? To which I say, Paul answered that already in chapter 2. Those that die without the law or without the gospel will perish without the gospel. Or perhaps another objection, hey, what about the dinosaurs? Uh, yeah, what about the dinosaurs? <coughs> right? And it's, it's funny because we've heard that when we try to witness to someone. <coughs> How is that going to help you with God's judgment? As Hebrews 9.27 says, right? It is appointed for everyone, for every man who wants to die, and then the judgment. How is that objection going to help you? Or do you try to divert the topic when somebody is sharing the gospel with you? Hey, what about all those other religions? What about all those other beliefs? I would point you to the words of Jesus when he said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And as we see in 
the chap in the fourth chapter of Acts where it says that there is salvation under no other name except under the name of Christ. Or perhaps as someone is being convicted of them being guilty of the law of God and they all of a sudden say, hey, but what do you mean? Like, what about aliens? And at some point we got to say, well, this is a case in which God, the Holy Spirit, is going to have to convict that person, right? Because they know they are being condemned. But as chapter 1 of Romans, verse 18 says, they are suppressing the truth of God. And what seemingly seems like intellectual objections is only a disguise for the person loving their sin and refusing to repent. Now let me talk a little bit more to the professing Christian. What objections do you have? Specifically, when a brother or a sister lovingly points something in your life that is sinful and directs you to scripture. What is your objection or your excuse when you show no urgency to repent? No desire to be accountable. No desire to connect to a local church and serve. But you're just kind of cruising along. What is your excuse or what is your objection to that? My word to you today is examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. And for both the skeptic, the non-believer, and the professing Christian, for all of us churchgoers here, let's hear this and understand. Whatever objections the audience of Paul had ultimately didn't matter. Do you think that your objections matter to God? Do you think what you think about God matters to him? Not one bit. Now, what God thinks of us, what God thinks of you matters. And it matters for eternity. So, as rebellious sinners that we are, we better take account of knowing where will the wrath of God fall when it comes crushing down. Realize that nothing you can do will show you favor before him. Neither your objections, nor your excuses, nor your false profession of faith, except to truly fall on the mercy of Christ by faith. So that the righteousness of Jesus can be credited to your account. So repent. Acknowledge the bad news. The horrible bad news. So that you can embrace the true good news and believe the gospel. Now lastly, God will judge sinners. But there is a great hope. What is that? That the most dreadful manifestation of the crushing down of the wrath of God on someone has already happened. And that happened at Calvary, at the cross of Christ, where God did not spare his own son. For he pierced him for our transgressions. Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. As the, prophet, as the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 53. So my friends, in faith, let's ask God to give us understanding of what it is to repent of our sin. And what it means to put our faith in Christ. In that he lived a perfect life, that he suffered, that he died, and that he rose again. So that he could give us the hope that we desperately need. I will close from a quote by J.A. Packer. I don't have it in the notes, but I have it here. It says, Repentance is more than just sorrow for the past. Repentance is a change of mind and heart, a new life of denying self and serving the Savior as King in self's place. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you because as you declare in the book of Psalms that you are a God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. 
Lord, may your Holy Spirit grant us repentance, true repentance, today, that we may trust in Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. And so that we may not have any twisted ideas of who you are and of your righteousness, but that we would submit to your Lordship in obedience. We ask these things according to your will, and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.